Hey, my name is uh, Floor. I'm a woman in my 30s. I have blonde short hair and I'm wearing a gray sweater with a dinosaur on it. Um, I'm streaming from my living room uh, and in the background there's uh, a couple of books. Hello, I'm Susanna Daniels and I'm a white female with dark brown hair. I am wearing a black polo and a pinkish pants. I'm sitting in my home office. Behind me is a retro wallpaper and I'm sitting in my comfy chair. Hi, my name is Adam. I am a white man, 32 years old, sitting in my home office with a TV behind me with lots of cuddly toys on screen. Today, I'm wearing a t-shirt which says, you're on mute. Hello everyone, my name is Donna Sarkar. I am a olive skin woman with long dark hair. I'm wearing a blue hoodie with my Twitter handle, Donna Sarkar, down my left arm. I am currently sitting in my fashion design studio. In addition to being a software engineer, I'm also a fashion designer. So I'm surrounded by beautiful, colorful fabric from all over the world. What you don't see is that I have dyslexia. So reading teleprompters can be quite challenging for me. I'm a woman with a dark skin and I have dark hair, long hair. I have also dark glasses on and I have a sweater with long sleeves and in the background I have a white wall. It's important to describe myself because you might not be able to see that I have a accessibility requirement. Um, I'm four foot one. I'm a cook Asian male, HV1, have brown hair and I have uh, headphones here and I'm sitting in my home office with some plants in the background. Now that you understand that I'm the only person in the room, you also understand that I have accessibility requirements and I might not be able to reach anything that you put anywhere high up though. So you've met my requirements just by understanding that I am different um, and not able to reach anything high. Many times an audience will not understand the why behind certain things. They won't understand why we have audio descriptions at the beginning of someone introducing themselves. They don't know why we have a sign interpreter. They don't know why we have captions. They don't know why our speakers are diverse because they may just not have that context. So I prefer to assume good intention and say, most people just don't know. It's not that they're jerks. It's that they don't know that there's billions of people in the world who do not learn like you do who do not communicate like you do, who don't see the world the way you do. Being inclusive um, really means not just, not just checking a box, it's actually including different voices, different perspectives. It's more than equality or diversity. It's thinking about what's the way that I can bring everyone round the table in this scenario, and whether that's in a in-person gathering where there's 10 people, how can everyone speak up? Can, can we be proactive in making sure quieter people are given time to express themselves? But it's also when we think about whether that's planning an event um, or planning a piece of content, making sure that we pull people from lots of different communities and also intersectional communities where there's more than one thing that might make them diverse or different and, uh, and making sure that we are lifting those voices up. So, for example, in an event, I might think about, uh, you know, how many different races that we have um, represented, but I also want to think about the gender, I want to think about sexual orientation, I want to think about where people are from and what their life experiences are and, uh, you know, are they neuro neurodiverse, do they have any disabilities? So um, it's great to have all of these things in your mind and just think, what different things can people bring to the table when everyone's included? Um, so for, for me, everyone uh, needs to feel included because uh, I want everyone to have the same opportunity to learn uh, from each other and to learn and to discover. Um, so naturally, everything that excludes people from opportunities to learn uh, is something that in my eyes needs to be fixed. Um, and uh, every day still I learn about how my thoughts or my actions can exclude people uh, and I try to like eliminate those one by one. Um, but it also makes me realize that inclusion is not an end goal that you can, can achieve and then you can move on with your life. Like it's something that needs uh, work uh, constantly. Um, 
it's it's more more than an end goal it's sort of an ongoing activity uh active is in you don't you can't open an opportunity like a call for speakers for your event and then think that they will come uh, you need to actively uh, go to people that you would otherwise maybe not reach because they don't read your your uh, twitter uh, and actively go out there and and include them in whatever you want to uh, achieve for me, being inclusive means considering points of view that are very different than yourself. One, that one's the obvious one. But the second part that I think is really important is to work with people on the solution. So don't create a solution that you think will work for people. Put it in front of them and say, does this work for you? Yes or no? It's more really understand what are the challenges the other person is facing then work with them to create, co-create a solution that will work for them, but also all of the other audiences. So while being inclusive may seem like incredibly time consuming at the beginning, it's the only way to guarantee that your product or service will be usable and appreciated by all kinds of people. It's important to be accessible because you have customers. Now, uh, if you were to uh, do everything in uh, one shade of gray, so, for example, uh, to cater for uh, your website in, in red uh, and the errors in red, one out of every 20 men are colorblind. So you would exclude those people from catering for your, your website. If you were to cater for everyone with perfect eyesight, you would exclude the silver generation, the generation over age 65, uh, who have uh, failing eyesight. Like myself, I, I use glasses. So to cater for the average is to, uh, to exclude everyone else. And we saw this when the US Department of Defense was catering for the, the, uh, the perfect cockpit for their pilots. And they brought in 4,000 uh, people and they measured them up and they said, cool, let's create the cockpits for uh, that average person. And people started dying and uh, planes started crashing. So they, they re-looked at the study and they realized that it wasn't comfortable for anyone and they couldn't even fly the planes. So they made it adjustable. And uh, now uh, we benefit from that uh, technology in our car seats because now instead of having just the average car seat, you can adjust it to accommodate all of those, uh, those uh, individual drivers. And it's the same with software. If we adjust it for everyone, they won't even know that they have accessibility requirements. They'll just adjust it to their liking and you've catered for all of your customers, all of your developers and everyone who wants to use your product. Well, most of the time I feel included, uh, but there are still occasions when I feel not taken seriously or uh, I feel undervalued. So I certainly feel included. I have lots of privilege as an individual. I speak the English language. I am based in a country that has lots of resources and uh, in terms of captioning, which is the, probably the only accessibility requirement I have myself, I find that most people have really adapted to that. I guess one area where, uh, where that, that doesn't exist is sometimes with live streaming, um, captioning isn't always available. And as we go back to being a bit more in person, as I've said before, sometimes I feel a bit excluded when I'm in a really noisy place. So I'm trying hard to make sure that I don't put myself in that position. But in general, yes, I do feel included. I'm not sure if I feel included. As I grew up with a person with a hearing loss, I always felt excluded. And I was always wondering about communication. I was confronted every day with miscommunications, with everyone around me talking in a spoken language, trying to communicate with me. And I always felt very lonely um, as I had no way of communicating and it was impossible to gain knowledge. I became very frustrated in my environment. After a while, when there was more technology available, um, if there was a person who couldn't sign or could not understand my communication, who was mumbling and I had a very hard time lip reading that person, even though I practiced for hours and hours, I still felt very uncomfortable. 
But you know, if I met friends who were used to me and who I could sign with, I felt just, you know, amazing. I felt as an equal because I could communicate equally with them. And I learned a lot. So when I, you know, had an interpreter as well, I learned through interpreting services, which was an amazing opportunity. Yes and no. Uh, I think I feel included in, in certain communities, whereas if you enter another community that can look very different. Um, so when I look at, uh, for instance, the Ruby community or maybe even sort of the DevOps community, uh, then yes, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I belong there. And then uh, there's other communities where it's much harder and it almost seems like you need to prove yourself worthy of uh, belonging to that group. So I'm South African. I'm uh, born in Johannesburg and I was born in a time that accessibility and uh, what we uh, called them at the time, handicapped people, weren't really understood nor catered for. Um, so uh, when I grew up, a lot of the uh, accessibility requirements to cater for someone of my stature, um, and, and I wasn't even four foot one there, I was even smaller, um, could, couldn't really be matched. So I had to kind of, uh, you know, what we call bolt on for a lot of the requirements. Uh, when I sat on a chair, when I wanted to reach something, even when I wanted to learn how to drive, I had to kind of uh, make sure that everything was kind of uh, higher and adjusted uh, for m uh, my liking. But it, it wasn't really that when I would approach someone who uh, uh, was catering for me understood my requirements because accessibility wasn't on the top of their mind. It was always, we'll do it after the fact. We'll bolt it onto your car, we'll bolt it onto your, your chair. We won't really design the product to cater for that. So that really was kind of one of my inspirations to, to pursue as an accessibility advocate to make sure that people on the top of the mind, it's not built on, but rather cater for everyone uh, with their unique accessibility uh, needs based on my experience as I grew up. I grew up in a place in the US called Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is a fairly low income area. So testing, young people and students for dyslexia or ADHD were, was not a thing that we did in Detroit public schools. Part of it was just lack of awareness and the other part was lack of resources to do that. So I have always had dyslexia, but I didn't realize it. It manifested itself in me looking at words on a page or on a screen and them all getting jumbled up when I got nervous. So it really manifests manifests itself when people are looking at me. Now, I was labeled as having stage fright as be and being shy throughout my childhood. And that was an identity I grew up with, with this thought that I am not good at talking in front of people. I have stage fright, I am shy. These are all things I said over and over again. So I didn't not feel included. I just felt labeled by something that was not exactly accurate because now I speak for a living in front of millions of people every year. And I don't have stage fright, nor am I shy, but I do have dyslexia. So sign language is a visual language, as a visual modality. And um, there are lots of features in sign language. First of all, it's closely rela related to a culture. And many people always assume that sign language is international, but every country has their own national sign language. So we have Dutch sign language in the Netherlands, NGT. You have American sign language, for example. Uh, you have British sign language, uh, which is very different from American. You have French sign language. Um, so they're all different sign languages across the world and they're very different from each other. So it's definitely not universal, uh, but in sign language, there are many global features that, are, that sign languages have in common as a visual language. Um, whether or not online events are more or less inclusive uh, than sort of the physical events, I think that depends. Um, so if these are, events are maybe more affordable, um, 
have optimized their code of conduct to work for sort of the virtual space, um, uh, not only the code of conduct itself, but also the reporting mechanisms um, that they don't say, like walk up to the person with a, a staff shirt on and report your issue because, well, you can't actually walk up to that person with a staff shirt on. Um, so then um, if it offers captioning, if it offers maybe sign language interpretation, uh, if the event page and the platform are uh, accessible, um, then maybe yes, because in, then you would only need an internet connection and a device and maybe uh, have to purchase the ticket, but hopefully it's a little bit more affordable or even free, then, then yes. I do think that online events are more inclusive and accessible. Um, I myself like to watch on-demand events at uh, a very fast pace, sometimes at two times the, the pace, and then I also put the captions at the bottom because I suffer also from something called generalized anxiety. So I get really anxious um, and I get really hyper uh, sometimes. Um, so as a result, I don't like to just sit there and stare at an event. Uh, I like to watch things very fast and then I can keep my attention else. I just go off and I don't watch it. And that's just one kind of uh, accessibility requirements. So online events, um, if you look at it, how much they are accessible, I would definitely say that that's the case. Prior to COVID, I would have to travel to a place and, you know, I would not have any access there and I would be very frustrated because there were barriers. Now I'm at home and I can, you know, really easily communicate because I can put an interpreter on screen any moment that I want. I can have live captioning. I can have sign language interpretation. I can enlarge the image of the interpreter as well. So that makes communication a lot easier um, when you're talking about an online event. Although I must say it is quite exhausting because you constantly have to look and focus on the screen. I can't like persons who can hear can just look the other way and not focus on the screen all the time. But I need to look at the screen constantly in order to get the information. I have no moment of rest. So I need to communicate via the screen in all ways, in visual ways, in text ways, in any ways. So I always have to look at the screen to communicate. And, you know, I also have to look sometimes really closely to see the interpreter because I can't enlarge the interpreter. And I don't really like that. So with an online event, if there's a possibility to enlarge the size of the interpreter, that's great. I think that certainly they can be less inclusive just because not everyone identifies with an online event in the way that they um, identify and participate with an in-person event. But on the same, you know, on the other side of the coin, so to speak, there are people who really don't enjoy in-person events that have really loved the fact that we offer events online, especially through the pandemic. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, certain people Perhaps, you know, for example, the people that do require captioning have, you know, and I, I'm one of those people that really enjoys having captioning. We found it really, really positive in some ways that so many events are online because the captioning is available. And that's something that you really rarely saw at an in-person event or meetup was that was that opportunity to have that. The main thing for me about online events has really been bringing people together from different places. And um, we, we can't do this with um, in-person events. We can't say, oh, I'm, you know, we've got a meetup in London tonight. Could you just, um, you know, fly from Johannesburg to speak for half an hour? We can't do that in an in-person event. But an, on an online event, um, we can absolutely be inclusive of people from different parts of the world, people that are less able to travel. So I've really enjoyed that. And certainly when I'm planning an event in London, I'm always thinking, well, how can we include voices from all around Europe and all around Africa? After all, they're in the same time zone. So why not include them at the same time as well? I feel that online events are both more and less inclusive, depending on the event and the person. And 
Part of the reason I say that is because when an event is online, someone who may have a mobile disability or someone who might not be as comfortable being out in the world are able to attend and watch and listen and understand. The reason I say they're less inclusive is because people who are at home, um, they have less opportunity to go out into the world and build relationships with others. So while it might be more inclusive in terms of absorbing content and learning, it's less so in terms of building relationships with other people so you can be more involved. Like, for example, if we were at a real conference, then we would be able to sit down with people and say, what can we do to the speaker room to make it more inclusive? Should we have you know, interpreters in the front? Should we have uh, audio description type people, people who do audio descriptions for others throughout the room? When there, it's Q&A time, we want to provide an opportunity for all kinds of people to be able to ask those questions. So those are easier to do in person, um, co-creating with people in real life. But I do believe that inclusive, having events be online opens it up to millions of people all over the world many who, of whom wouldn't have been able to travel to do an in-person event. If organizers would like to provide sign language interpretation services, first of all, I think uh, that's really important. Um, but they need to also keep in mind that there's quite a diversity of people who use sign language interpretation services. So first of all, they need to check which sign language the deaf person would prefer. Is it international sign? Is it a national sign language? And what is the source? Is um, the presentation, for example, in English or is the presentation in another spoken language? So all these, uh, that language regime, regime or those choices have to be kept in mind. It's also very important to discuss this within the team and with the deaf person, what they would prefer. So, you know, ask the interpreter, ask the deaf person, make sure that it's collaboration between all stakeholders. Don't just get any interpreter and then ask the deaf person, but really make it a discussion and make sure that everyone is happy with the service provided, the service provided themselves, but also the person who uses the interpreting service. Then when looking at the screen, uh, for me, it's very important that uh, there's not any visual noise in the background of the interpreter. So there's a plain background, which is calm, um, as a plain color and has quite a contrast with the interpreter, him or herself. So I can really see the interpreter well uh, from the background. In addition, as said, it uh, should be a reasonable size of where the interpreter is displayed so I can see the interpreter well. And thirdly, the interpreter also needs preparation material before the event so they can actually understand what the topic is, if there's any specific terminology or technical terminology. So the interpreter uh, will be able to deliver a better quality service. For me, a code of conduct is, is sort of an agreement between uh, even, even you and me, how we want to coexist in uh, the event, in the situation, in the context that we uh, that we are in. Um, and by adopting and promoting a code of conduct, uh, organizers have something to point to when someone, one of the participants uh, shows behavior that, that is excluding other people or uh, um, is maybe even actually harmful uh, to other people and they have something to point to and say like we have, uh, we, we in our code of conduct state that this is the uh, behavior that we will not tolerate and if we see any kind of this uh, uh, behavior, this is how we will follow up on it. Inclusive language basically comes down to having language, using language with, which doesn't exclude anybody. One of the things that I would, would definitely say is stay away from very gendered language. Um, I've seen a uh, uh, copy that is then about the developer and then in the next sentence uh, he refers to the developer um, where I think I'm a developer but if apparently he is the only uh, pronoun used for, for developer, then maybe that maybe I was wrong. Inclusive language 
is an ongoing art form, first of all, because what we would consider inclusive five years ago, we would consider quite exclusive right now. Like for example, um, in the disability community, something that many people prefer is person with disability language, meaning I would say, I am someone with dyslexia rather than a dyslexic person. That was something I learned recently. Another one is just having an audio description at all, meaning introducing myself by how I look before I start giving my talk. That itself is inclusive language. So I'm part of the LGBTQI plus community and often get asked, how can we be inclusive of this community in our events? And the truth is, you know, this community is made up of many different subgroups of people. So I am a gay man um, and uh, I obviously have an affinity with many parts of the LGBTQI plus community. Instead of thinking just about running an event for LGBTQI plus, I often think about how can we include, how can we break down what brings this community together? And there's three things that are really important. There's sexual orientation, which is uh, you know, is someone um, gay or lesbian or pansexual. Um, there's um, gender identity, and that's um, in terms of, you know, how do you, do you feel um, inside you like a man or a woman or non-binary or something in between. Um, and then there's gender expression, which is, you know, do you, uh, I don't know how to put this, do you act very masculine or very feminine or are you somewhere in between or do you identify in some other way and the best way of thinking about this is just like I said before find the different voices and people that are in different places and then you can be inclusive um, you know more generally and don't just think about um, where people are in the LGBTQI plus community also always think about where are these people are there other um, things that are diverse about them in an intersectional way and how can we include those people? But it's it's never an easy ask and I would say for anyone that wants to be more inclusive of LGBTQI plus communities, have a look at some of the local nonprofits in your area and, and learn more. By learning more, you will be able to be more inclusive. So three things that I would advise to make things accessible is to always ask the person what they need, what kind of service they need to have the event accessible. So that's the first. Then there are lots of experts that you can also ask uh, with whom you should collaborate. And really they could give you advice on how to make things accessible or your event accessible. And the third one, I would really like to ask this, is that yes, we should have a sign language interpreter on screen, but we would also need um, something where, you know, the presenter uh, does not comment and focus on the interpreter on screen. I don't like it that, um, you know, the interpreter is there to interpret, but you see that people who are on screen or our presenter are always commenting on the interpreter. And that really is, not appreciated. So I'm just wondering, I'm just pleading to everyone who's watching now and who's who I'm talking to, to please not comment on the interpreter because they are actually interpreting. They're there to interpret and nothing else. Three things that people putting on events should be doing. One, reach out to your friends or people in your community who have disabilities people who are blind, people who are deaf, people who may have a neurodivergence and ask them, what are some things you've seen done well? And what are some things you'd like to see done better at online events or in-person events? And really listen to what their takes are and their insights, because you do not know you want to co-create that with them. So that's one. Second thing, once you make a list of accommodations, publicize them. This is not a secret. Your accommodations aren't the witness protection program publicize them and say, our events, we will have a sign translator, caption options, these languages, um, a transcript, you know, uh, an opportunity to have focus mode. Everything is recorded so you can consume it after. What are the accommodations you're putting into place? So make sure you spell them out and make them available to everyone. And the third thing is ask for feedback after so that you can take what you've done, but also test it with this audience for the event and then have a debrief after with anyone with disabilities who wants to participate 
and learn what you can do better next time. It's the only way we're going to put on better events by co-creating with the audiences we want to have.